Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 328 of our Bible study review. Today, we're going through the chapters 24 through 26 of the book of Acts. Now we're going to open up and read the case against Paul that the Yehudin have against their own, right? But Paul was born in Rome, so he has a Roman citizenship, which is helping him out in the moment right now. But let's read starting from verse 1. It says, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, arrived with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. Hopefully I'm saying his name right. They brought before the governor their charges against Paul. When he was summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you we enjoy much peace and your foresight is bringing reforms to this nation with all thankfulness, most excellent Felix, all right? So this is their lawyer, the Pharisees. This is their lawyer who is buttering up Felix first before he brings the charges against Paul. And so that's what he said first. And he says, we always welcome it everywhere, but not to detain you further. I beg you briefly, hear us in your patience. Now he starts his charges against Paul. He says, we have found this man, a troublemaker, instigating riots among the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. We know that Paul took a Nazarene vow, right? His head is shaved and many others went in with him. But let's continue. It says, he even tried to profane the temple. So we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law, aka Torah. But the commander, Lysias or Lysias, came to us and forcefully took him out of our hands, ordering his accusers to come before you. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn about all of these things concerning which we accuse him. The Jews assented, alleging these things to be true. Now Paul is going to stand up and give his defense. Paul is his own lawyer. He has been studying the law since he's a little one, right? All he needs is Yeshua in him and most definitely all of heaven is backing up Paul in this moment and so it says after the governor motioned to him to speak Paul answered knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation I cheerfully defend myself you got to butter them up first you got to honor them before you give your case all right and it says you may verify that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship Paul continues and he says, they did not find me in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd. They cannot prove the things concerning which they now accuse me. However, I affirm that in accordance with the way which they call a sect, I worship the Elohim of my fathers and believe everything written in the Torah and in the prophets. I have hope in Elohim that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and and the unjust, which they also expect. In this do I always strive to have a clear conscience toward Elohim and towards men. And while we are reading this, just remember yesterday when we were reading how many men took a vow that they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul. Well, it's been 12 days. I'm pretty sure they're starving and they're pretty thirsty by now. So anyways, let's keep reading in verse 17. It says, now after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, right? Because Paul has been out. He's been sharing the gospel and now he's back and he's saying, look, when some of the Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a crowd or an uproar, they ought to be here before you to accuse me if they have any charges or let these men say what crime they have found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it is concerning this one statement, which I cried out while standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead. I am being judged by you this day. Remember when we were going through yesterday's reading, how Paul was speaking before the Jews and he was speaking in front of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he says look I'm being judged because of the hope and the resurrection and then it caused dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees so this is what he's talking about right here let's pick up in verse 22 it says when Felix the governor who had more exact knowledge concerning the way had heard this he adjourned the proceedings and said when Lysias or Lysias the commander arrives I will decide your case when he ordered the centurion to guard Paul and to let him have liberty and to forbid none of his own people from attending to him. Verse 24, it says, after several days, when Felix arrived with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him speak concerning the faith in Messiah. Now, do you see this? 
there's a Roman man who has a Jewish wife or a Yehudin as a wife. So we see that there's always been a mixture in the culture of the children of Israel. So Felix, the governor, sent for Paul, and now he's listening to Paul, right? Giving of his testimony and speaking about the way, speaking about following Messiah. And so let's continue reading in verse 25. It says, as he lectured about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment, Felix was afraid and answered, for now, leave. When time permits, I will send for you. So Felix was afraid. Felix heard the truth and he got scared. And so let's continue reading. It says, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. So we see Felix is corrupt or Felix really doesn't care about righteousness. He just doesn't want to deal with this trouble. So he was hoping that Paul would give him money and he could just release him and be done with this, like wash his hands of it. But when he heard the righteousness that Paul was speaking, he was like, all right, that's enough for now, right? Have your friends and your family done that when you're speaking the truth of the word and it starts to stir something on the inside of them and they get scared and they tell you, stop talking, stop talking. That is what happened to Governor Felix. And so it says he sent for him more often and conversed with him. So Felix continued to hear from Paul, but only in bits and pieces. And so it says, but after two years, it says that Porcius Festus, hopefully I'm saying that name right, succeeded Felix and Felix desired to do the Jews a favor and left Paul imprisoned. Think about it. Felix was married to a Jewish woman, right? A Yehudin woman. And we don't know if she was siding with the Jews about wanting to, you know, do harm to Paul. And so, you know, he really wasn't looking out for Paul, although Paul was giving him advice and instructing him in the way, you know, there was another who succeeded him. And so he just kept Paul in chains. He kept Paul in prison. Now we walk into chapter 25. Paul's case is still open. He's imprisoned and now there's a new governor, one who is not familiar with his case. And so now it has switched hands. Let's read about it. It says, now three days after Festus had come into the province, he went from Caesarea up to Jerusalem. The high priest and the elders of the Jews spoke to him against Paul and they begged him asking as a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem plotting to kill him along the way do you see that the Jews know that there's a new governor that's not familiar with the case so they're asking him to release Paul so that Paul can go to Jerusalem so that they can finish out their vow that they made there's 40 men who vowed to kill Paul. So they're still trying to, you know, make this happen. They have a hope that now there's a new governor that they don't, you know, he doesn't know a thing and maybe they can actually have what they want. But let's keep reading in verse four. It says, Festus said that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. He also said, let the men in authority go down with me. If there is anything wrong in the man, let them accuse him. Having stayed among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea and the next day he sat on the judgment seat and ordered that Paul be brought in. When he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him and brought many serious charges against him, which they could not while he defended himself, saying, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I sinned at all. Verse 9. Desiring to do the Jews a favor, Festus answered, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem to be judged concerning these charges before me? So Festus doesn't know the deal. And he's like, Well, maybe I can just send Paul to Jerusalem and maybe we can handle this case a little sooner right? He doesn't know what Felix knew. And so now we see Paul knows the deal though. So Paul is going to speak up and he says, I am standing before Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you know very well. If I am doing wrong or have done anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if these are empty charges of which these men accuse me, no one may deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. And so it says, when Festus had conferred with the council, he answered, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. This fulfills the prophecy that came out of our Messiah's mouth, telling Paul that not only is your testimony going to go all throughout Jerusalem, you're going to go to Rome and testify about me there. This is part of the plan. 
just go back and read Acts chapter 23, verse 11, and you will see how this is actually moving forward. I also want you to remember the words of our Messiah that's recorded in the Gospels. He told them, look, later on, you're going to be imprisoned. They're going to flog you. And he says, when they ask you to give an account, he says, don't study what you'll say. I will fill your mouth. I will tell you what to say. And we see that's happening right now. Paul doesn't need anyone else to represent him because he's got the king of glory living on the inside of him, giving him the words to say. Let's pick up in verse 13. It says, after several days, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to welcome Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus stated Paul's case to the king saying, there is a man left as a prisoner by Felix. When I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me about him, asking for a sentence against him. I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to die before he who is accused meets the accusers face to face and has the opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge brought against him. At least the Romans are doing things lawfully and allowing Paul to have a proper case, unlike those back in Jerusalem doing lawless things. All right, but let's pick up in verse 17. It says, so when they assembled here without delay, I sat on the judgment seat the next day in order that the man be brought in. And he's talking about Paul. He says, when the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such crimes as I had supposed. But they had disagreements with him about their own religion and about a man named Yeshua, aka Jesus, who had died, but whom Paul asserted was alive. Being perplexed about such questions, I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and be tried there concerning these charges. But when Paul had appealed to be under guard for the decision of Caesar, I ordered that he be secured until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. He said, tomorrow you shall hear him. As we pick up in verse 23, we see it is the next day and King Agrippa is going to hear directly from Paul. So let's read about it. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and they entered the hall with the commanders and the leading men of the city. They made this big commotion, right? And so it says, when Festus gave the order, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are present here with us, you see this man concerning whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me both at Jerusalem and here shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death. But when he himself appealed to Caesar, I decided to send him. But I have nothing to write to his majesty concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that upon examination, I might have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without signifying the charges against him. Now we open up chapter 26 and we see that King Agrippa, he addresses Paul and he says, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And so Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. And he said, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate that today I shall make my defense before you against all of the accusation of the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to patiently listen to me. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning in my own nation and at Jerusalem is known by all of the Jews. They know me from the beginning and could testify if they wished how according to the strictest sect of our religion as I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial for the hope and the promise made by Elohim to our fathers to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve Elohim day and night. Concerning this hope, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Then Paul asks a question and he says, why is it judged incredible by you that Elohim raises the dead? I too thought that I must do many things contrary to the name of Yeshua of Nazareth, which I indeed did in Jerusalem and locked up many of the saints in prison by authority from the chief priest. And when they were killed, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often and in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. He compelled them to lie on the fact that Yeshua 
is the Messiah, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Okay. And he says, look, I put pressure on them to deny him basically. And so it says, and being extremely enraged against them, I persecuted them even to the foreign cities. So I went to Damascus with authority and a commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw along the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. When we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew language, Shaul, Shaul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness, both of what you have seen and of what I will yet reveal to you. Do you see that? Our Messiah had yet to reveal some things to Paul. And Paul tells us about those things a little bit later. But let's keep reading. It says, I will deliver you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to Elohim, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul continues his testimony of all of the things that he walked through, right? When he was killing those within the body. And then he saw the Messiah. He was stopped in his tracks. And now, you know, he's actually walking in the way. So he's given the testimony about this to King Agrippa. And so he continues and he says, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those at Damascus, then at Jerusalem and throughout all of the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to Elohim and do works proving their repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having abstained help from Elohim, I continue this day, testifying to small and to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah must suffer, that he would be the first who would rise from the dead and would announce light to his people, his own people first, the line whom he came through, the remnant that came back from Babylon, right? Which was mainly the tribe of Judah. There was the tribe of Levi and there was also the tribe of Benjamin. But we know that all of them just call themselves Jews. So that's what Paul is talking about. He goes, look, I said it so that it could go to his own people first and then to the Gentiles. Picking up in verse 24. So as he made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are mad. Much learning is turning you to madness. But Paul said, I am not mad, most excellent Festus. I speak the words of truth and reason. The king before whom I also speak freely knows about these things. For I am persuaded that none of this is hidden from him. For this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. And Paul responds and he says, I pray to Elohim that not only you, but all who hear me this day might become not only almost, but thoroughly and altogether what I am, except for these chains. When he had said this, the king rose as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. When they had gone aside, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. And then King Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul did not want to be set free. Paul wanted to obey the words of our Messiah and take the testimony of Yeshua to Rome. This is all part of the plan. Well, Deep in Word family, that's all that I have for you today. According to Paul's case, we will pick up tomorrow and finish out the book of Acts. Until then, Yah bless.